Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games, card games, and most of all, the people who play games. And now, here are your hosts, Suzanne and Mandy. On today's show, episode 519, we have so much goodness for you. We're going to talk about games with popsicle sticks, wizardly workers, conventions, and more. Welcome to the show, everyone. Mandy, that sounds like we've got some fun stuff to talk about today. Exciting show. I definitely think so. (laughs) For all of you new listeners, welcome to the Dice Tower Podcast. This is a podcast about board games and hobby games and all these cool games that you're seeing pop up in stores. And for you regular listeners, you may be noticing something a little different. And if you haven't listened to the live show recorded at Gen Con, uh, that's where this was all explained. So I will give you a clue that uh, at the Gen Con live show, Tom and Eric announced a little switch up to the way that the Dice Tower podcasts are going to go moving forward. And I have my lovely co-host Mandy here. Yay. Hello. And Mandy and I are actually going to be alternating episodes with Tom and Eric on the podcast moving forward. So this episode will just be Mandy and me talking about games. And the next episode will be Tom and Eric talking about games, uh, who are the voices that you are used to hearing here. But I know, Mandy, I won't speak for you, but I know I am so excited for this opportunity. I'm thrilled to have you as a podcasting partner, and I'm so thankful to all the listeners for going on this exciting journey with us. I, too, am super excited. I'm glad we're doing this together, because how many times have people said, we, sh- we are like superhero team, we should do a podcast together. So <laughs> now it's happening. I hope that people are listening and enjoying <laughs> We're going to do our darndest and whatever. We're awesome. We're going to do great. So I'm not worried about it. (laughs) But of course, before we talk about a few games, just a little teeny tiny bit of show business. Just wanted to mention that, of course, the Dice Tower Cruise is coming up later on this year and that registrations or rooms for that are filling up. So, you know, if you are interested in this amazing experience of going on a cruise ship with all sorts of awesome gamers, relaxing, playing games, hanging out with the Dice Tower crew, this is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, I mean, I won't be there. And I don't, I, Mandy, are you going to be on the cruise? Uh, no, and I've never been on any cruise. <laughs> never any cruise? Girl, no. we gotta, <laughs> you gotta go on this cruise. We gotta figure out how to make that happen, okay? Oh, no, no. Next year, we are going. All right, it's a pact. It's a deal. We are going to make it happen. I like this plan. This is a solid plan. All right, Dice Tower Cruise. But if you are able to go this year, unlike Mandy and myself, make sure you go to DiceTowerCruise.com and read all the details about the cruise and how to register there. And now that Gen Con has wrapped, if uh, you are looking for the next big show opportunity to meet up with the Dice Tower team, I think, Mandy, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's going to be Essen, the Spiel at Essen, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, and Tom and Z and Eric will all be over there. And I don't know, Mandy, who else? Who else is going to be at Essen this year? Uh, our, is it, is it Ste- Steffenfeld or us? I'm, I'm not sure which one is it. Oh, oh I forgot about Stefan. <laughs> oh, now. I, I was talking about us, but oh. Oh, now that you've talked about Steffenfeld. <laughs> Both are very good choices. So. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. But yes, uh, Mandy and I will be attest- attending the Spiel at Essen this year with the Dice Tower crew. So if you are attending that lovely event in Germany, make sure you stop by the Dice Tower space and we will all be there and we are looking forward to meeting you there. Absolutely. Very excited for that. Um, so I, I'm I am very excited to be at Essen. I am not very excited for like the 18 hours of flying. It's going to take me to get there. <laughs> That's, see, that's where I just download lots of episodes of House of Cards, and you know, got like six seasons, so we're good. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I think I've never watched House of Cards, but that's a good recommendation. I think I'm gonna have to pick that up that series up myself. I think for this trip because that's <laughs> a lot of time on a plane, but yes. it'll be worth it. It'll be great. But uh, that's really all I got for show news this time around. And I mean, come on, we're a gaming podcast. So let's let's talk about some darn games already, huh? Yahoo games, games. So all right, Mandy, what what have you been playing? Tell me about a game you've been playing lately. Okay, so let me start off by saying 
Oh, I oh, I really like this game. Okay, I know that should be last, but too bad. Spoiler alert! <laughs> Spoiler! You're getting it first, okay? So, the game am I talking about? Argent the Consortium. I just love the title. So it was designed by Trey Chambers. The artist is Jennifer Easley, Eunice Abigail Tu, and the publisher is Level 99 Games. So another game from them that I also enjoy is Millennium Blades, but we'll save that for another show. <laughs> So in Argent the Consortium, for those who are not familiar, basically uh, they're selecting a new chancellor at the Argent University of Magic. And you're one of the candidates to to try and get this job. So you have your apprentices at your spell books and you want to try and build influence uh, while trying to compete for this job. So this type of game is a worker placement and it's not just any worker placement it's a true worker placement but it is like super cutthroat but it's like cutthroat in a way that it's not overly mean i know that doesn't make any sense whatsoever but i didn't feel like i wanted to cry after playing i actually felt kind of happy about doing some like maybe not so nice things so you also have a bit of engine building in there as well uh but basically you have spells that you can use and you start off with a main spell. And you also have, uh, so you have a person or a player that you're acting as, you know. So in my case, we I've only played it the one time so far, but we played with the A side, which makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but you have some of these secret kind of goals, you know, or basically influence that you're trying to find out um, how you can attain them. So, you know, things like uh, most amount of gold or most amount of spells or things like that. But you don't know. It's all a secret until you can place what you call marks. And when you place these marks, it allows you to see what these goals are through the da- the game so you can try and obtain them. So I was horrible at that. I just kind of blindly played and said, okay, let's hope for the best. But um, it definitely helps you to win. I mean, that is the goal of the game. So they have different buildings. And depending on how many players you're playing with, you can take your mages and place them on the buildings to take these actions. So your mages are of different colors. Uh, Some work better with spells like the gray ones. My memory is a bit poor on what each one does, but they have red mages. And uh, they also have mages that are, um, I think it's blue and green. And those ones can't be affected by uh, by wounds or spells, things like that. So those are really good when you're trying to place on a space so people don't try and, well, you know, kill you off. So I had a great (laughs) move, by the way. I totally blew up. I was saving this for the end. Blew up a building. So it was no longer, I blew it up and locked it down. That's right. Did I win the game? No, but it made me feel really good about somebody else not winning the game. Sorry, Bradley. So so like other games that I've played from level 99, it was a very smart game. Um, I definitely recognized some of the characters from Millennium Blades, which was really nice. Um, I liked the fact that you had lots of opportunity to gain um, influence because it's not points, right? It's influence that you're trying to gain. And gaining these influences gives you these tokens that allow you to kind of take higher spots because you resolve your turns in buildings and in order. So you Mm want to be in that top spot. Mm -hmm. And there were certain buildings that you know, you really got a lot of rewards from to help you kind of gain more uh, towards the goals. Anyway, long story short, it was definitely a game that I thoroughly enjoyed and I'm not usually one that likes like a cutthroat type game but it's a worker placement which I love and it was just a very smart game I loved the theme of like that whole magical school and you're trying to get a job it just it totally appealed to me and I really liked the fact that I, I, I really like the fact that you could take different paths and still do really well. Like somebody was just focusing on spells and their turns would be comprised mostly of spells. You know what I mean? And somebody else would have cards that were using. And anyway, basically to say that you could take a variety of ways to kind of gain more influence and gain more knowledge in order to win. So loved this game, loved the mm-hmm. theme, loved the concept. It really worked for me. I, I love worker placement and I love that idea of like workers with powers. Yes. And that theme, come on, like I, wizarding school, that's so much fun. I think that's really cool. I'm glad to hear you liked it. I um, I have to admit, I've not played a full game of it. It 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 it's a what I played of it, I really enjoyed, but it is a beast. It's it's a huge like it takes a lot of table space. Oh yeah. And um, and we just we started it really late at night, and we were just a little too tired because it does have a lot going on. But you're 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 inspirational. I really want to get this to the table. It's because it's it's also beautiful. So that's cool. It's go- so- and it's we played the first time five players. So like, <laughs> right off the bat, we played five players. Then we didn't throw any expansions or anything in, and we played on the A side. So and it did take us a little while, but we were lucky that we had uh, someone who knew the game to go through it. So and even at five players, I didn't feel it was lengthy. Nice, nice, man! You 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 jumped right into the deep end. That's aw- <laughs> that's awesome. So that was um, Argent the Consortium. God, it's such a great name. I love the way you say it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> 
Well, swinging to a very different type of game, (laughs) I uh, have been playing Tokyo Highway. And this is being published by a company called Iten out of Japan, actually. And the designers are Naotaka Shimamoto and Yoshiaki Tomioka. And this is actually a game that's not available pretty much anywhere other than in Japan. I was lucky enough to have a friend who attended Tokyo Game Market and picked up a copy for me. But some people may have seen pictures of it on the internet because basically this game looks like it's composed of a bunch of gray, round, like, cylinder pieces, like little stumps, and gray popsicle sticks. That's really what this game looks like it's made of. It's, they're not popsicle sticks. They're actually thinner. I don't know. Maybe they're corn dog sticks that are painted gray. <laughs> Corn like you know this, you know those skinny little corn dogs. Anyway, because um, they're a little skinnier than than traditional popsicle sticks here in the states, um, and you get these cars. And the way that you play this is that you each player gets a set of roads, those sticks, a set of um, columns, those little pillars, and um, a set of cars, ten cars, and you win the game by being the first person to get all your cars onto the highway system. So the way it's really simple, right? So the way this works is. Each turn, you put down some pillars and then uh, put a road that connects your new your new column to the previous one that you placed. The rule there is, though, the columns must be exactly one higher or one lower than the previous height. So if my last column was too high, my next column must be one high or three high. You get to choose. And there's no board. Your table is the board, so it's open. You can put that column anywhere on the table that reaches your previous one. And that that open field pathing is really cool. And later on in the game, it really starts melting your mind. And so you just take these turns putting columns and placing roads. And eventually you're going to end up with your roads closer to each other. And you get to put a car into the system, or it's called running a car. You get to run a car when you make one of your roads cross over an opponent's road for the first time. And so then that's how you get to put a car on. And that open pathing I talked about, the the height management, it is it looks it looks gorgeous on the table, first of all. This is a structural piece of art when you see it. And whenever we play it, everybody's whipping out their phones and taking pictures of it because it's just so darn beautiful. And I have to admit, that's why I bought it, because I saw pictures where I'm like, pretty, I must have it. Um, but then we played it and this, there is a real game here and it is, it messes with your mind because it's so open and you've really got to anticipate what your opponent is doing. You also get these little, if you get three, just three little yellow column pieces called junctions that let you branch off when you normally wouldn't be allowed to. And it lets you break that height rule for once. All of those pieces come together. Tokyo Highway is a fascinating, essentially abstract game with a stunning table presence. And it's really easy to set up and play. It's really easy to teach. It has a slum. It does have a dexterity element because if you knock over your opponent's pieces, you have to pay them in column pieces for every piece of theirs that you knock over, which is brutal because you can lose the game by not having pieces at the end of it. Um, Tokyo Highway from Itten Games is a blast. And before I get yelled at on the internet for talking about a game that's impossible to get, they are reprinting it. And the rumor is that the Board Game Geek store has purchased a large part of their next print run to make it available for gamers in a wider audience. So that's a Tokyo Highway. It sounds really cool. Like, I've never heard of it. It sounds super thematic. Like, you're talking about junctions and, you know, paths mm-hmm. of rows. It, it sounds like it's very thematic. Is it a take mm-hmm. that? Like, does it have that element? It almost seems like you'd want to cross over other people's paths. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, in a more than two player game, it gets bonkers in there because you can essentially like somebody can be working to cross over somebody else's road and you can essentially take it from them because once a road's been crossed it's marked off you can't score off of it anymore so you can essentially steal somebody else's scoring so yes that's a great point there is definitely a lot of take that in this one and um i personally enjoy that in game so it really clicked for me (laughs) So it's like, take that, but it's pretty. So it has, you know, (laughs) takes off the edge. (laughs) Exactly. Ah, Perfect description. 
So speaking of pretty games, I Ooh. recently played Skyward. So Skyward is designed by Brendan Evans. The artists are uh, Ely Yang. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Dmitry Lugunkov, Neil Martin, Stephen Preston. The publisher is Rule and Make. So it's a card drafting game. There's a bit of set collection. But the story behind it is that you have four factions who have put aside their differences to work for a better future. And they're trying to create this airborne city named Skyward. So in this game, it's actually very simple. I thought it was going to be much more complex, but I was like, oh, simple, but I enjoyed it. So in the game, you know, you have a board and everybody has, uh, there's cards. So basically it's a small board and cards and you're, you're trying to put cards into your airspace. So basically the goal is to try and trigger end game by completing six buildings uh, or more to trigger the end game. And then there's some scoring that'll happen depending on the cards in your airspace. So it's really neat because you have someone who acts as the warden and this warden is responsible for the split which is basically player turns. So what's going to happen is the warden, you deal out a certain amount of cards, and this is dependent on the amount of players. And uh, the warden gets to split them however they want. So some of the cards have different different things that happen. So there are some cards that are actual factions, and factions can be used as a payment for cost of building buildings. So on the side of the cards, they're cool because they're stackable. So if you stack them beside each other, they have like a little strip on the side that you can mm-hmm. actually see the impertinent information. So mm-hmm. there are the factions, which will kind of help pay for buildings. And then you have building cards, and those building cards have different um, effects that happen. So you have some that are continuous, you have some that are instant, you have some that are like for end game scoring. So you don't have a variety of things that happen there. So when you're doing the split of cards, the warden does this, and it doesn't have to be even. So you can have someone with one card and then another pile with like six. So, which I did, and that did not work out so well for me because <laughs> <laughs> there were some really bad cards in there. I was like, that's a really good one. But, you know, alas, it didn't uh, didn't go in my favor. So uh, you do the split, you take the cards and you play them out. If it's instant, you got to take care of it right away. That darn pigeon card, let me tell you, I had like <laughs> five of those when the game ended. Pigeons are bad unless you have a specific build building, which I did not have. Needless to say, I still won. Don't know how that happened, but it did. Mm. So <laughs> after you do the split, it goes in player order, uh, turn order, they take, uh, each player takes the different piles, right? Depending on um, how many people are playing. It kind of reminded me of New York Slice in that regard. So the mm-hmm. slicer and, you know, picks last, the same thing, the warden picks last. And it'll change up depending on who, where they place the warden token on which pile and somebody else will become the warden and do the split for the next round. Uh, also becoming the warden gives you a cog and cogs are like another form of payment for your building. So you can use that towards paying the cost of a building. So that's kind of neat. And that's literally the game. So you're basically drafting, trying to collect sets and points for the end of the game. Player that gets to six buildings or more triggers the end game, and then you tally your score. There's also a little um, variant or a little uh, expansion that comes with it. I haven't played with that. I've only played the base game. But um, I think it looks like it adds more to the building. So anyway, long story short, I liked it. It was a very light game. Like It's definitely something I could play at lunch very quick um, and very pretty. It, so. it looks beautiful. I'm, I've looked at the art and it looks gorgeous. And you kind of, you kind of captured me when you started talking about the warden splitting because the kind of the I split you choose or the yeah. I divide you decide mechanism. That's one of my <laughs> favorite game mechanisms. So that sounds, I got to check that out. That sounds super fun. Yeah, it's mm. really good. And it totally reminded me of New York Slice in that. Uh, that mechanism and people mm-hmm. love that. So I, mm-hmm. I thought it was really good. Very cool. I, 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 and, and, you know, gorgeous card games are kind of right in my favorite set of things. Of, of course. course. <laughs> well, you know, not what I would consider quite as gorgeous, I have to admit. <laughs> um, but still, you know, something I'm excited to talk about is Bonanza the Duel. Uh, for anybody that's familiar, Bonanza is a very, very well-known um, negotiation and trading card game about bean farming. <laughs> the You know, the... Oh, so common theme of bean farming. Delicious. Uh, And it's had expansions and um, other iterations. Uh, There's like a dice version of it as well. But Bonanza the Duel is the latest iteration of Bonanza. And the game's designed by Uwe Rosenberg. And the art is by Bjorn Pertoft, which I think has done a lot of the art for the Bonanza line. And it's published by Amigo Spiel and uh, Rio Grande right now. In Bonanza the Duel... You are still planting beans. You have cards that represent different beans, and they range from a value of 6 to 20, but only in the even numbers for some reason, which I don't think really has a bearing on the game, but whatever. Um, And 
you also have bonus cards that have these little patterns on them. And if you complete a bonus card, you'll get, um, you know, you work towards points there. But in, in Bonanza Duel, you're going to, you have three fields or three columns that you can plant bean cards in. And in turn, you're going to have a hand of cards and you must play the first card in your hand. And that's always been one of the tricks or twists to Bonanza is you cannot change the order of the cards in your hand. So you're going to play a bean from your, from your hand to one of your fields. And then because this is really a trading and negotiation game, but how do you do that in two-player game? They, they, they added some different mechanisms. So you then you flip over three random bean cards, and you look at them, and you figure out, okay, and then you make an offer to your opponent. Just a silent offer. It's got this little card sliding thing that you do. So I could slide a 10 over. Uh, this this marker. I don't actually show any cards. I just slide this 10 marker over, indicating I want to give them a 10 card. And then my opponent can either say, great, give me a 10 card. And if they do that, then I must give them a 10, either from the three I just flipped up, or I can give them a 10 for my hand. Which typically isn't great to lose cards from your hand, but this is also a way that you can mess around with the order of the cards in your hand because you can call a card from the middle of your hand, which is really nice. If I don't have a 10, if I was bluffing, though, I have to give them one of my gold coin cards that I've earned through the game. So that's an interesting twist there already. My opponent can also just say, 10, Schmen, I don't need a 10. I will give you a 14. And then they slide the 14 marker towards me. Oh, okay. Now I can say, okay, great. I'll take the 14 um, or not. And then that that's how you negotiate back and forth. You just kind of make these one-time offers back and forth until somebody accepts it. And it's either a bluff or a real thing. And if it's a real thing, you give them the card. So then I let's say I take that 14. Then I have to plant the 14, the three cards that I flipped up as well. But I can plant them in any order I choose. And I can discard one if I want to. So that's how you get these cards into the field. And ultimately, each bean has a different set value, essentially. So um, maybe they say, if you have three beans in this field and you harvest it, you get three you get one coin. If you have five beans, you get two coins. If you have eight beans, you get three coins, right? And you can choose to harvest one. So then you scoop them up, you turn them in for gold coins. At the end of the game, gold coins are points. Meanwhile, you also have those bonus cards that might have circle, circle, diamond, diamond. Okay. Well, that means if you can get the cards in your bean field to match that pattern, like six, six, eight, eight, you used to be a teacher, right, Mandy? So you know the A, B, A, B patterns. Does that sound yeah. familiar? Right? It's, it's kind of that thing, right? It doesn't matter which numbers you're, you're fulfilling the pattern with. It just has to fit that pattern. If you can do that, you also get to mark that bonus card, and then those can be worth points at the end, too. The other twist there is that if your opponent accidentally fulfills one of the bonus cards that are in your hands, you can also turn that in for points as well. So that's the kind of thing where you stay engaged and pay attention and kind of you can even try to, when you're bluffing or offering them cards, you can try to offer them cards that might fulfill one of your bonus cards and they don't know. So that is really Bonanza the Duel. Some hand management, some bluffing, things like that. I will say up front, I've never been a fan of the art in the Bonanza line of games, and it continues over here. I, I get the aesthetic. There's some art that's just really not my favorite in here. And it's one of the reasons I don't really, I'm not a huge fan of Bonanza, but I'll tell you, I am loving Bonanza the Duel. If my explanation was a little clunky and people are like, what the heck is she talking about? It's partly because there's so much going on in this game. I promise, the mechanisms are actually pretty simple, but the choices you're making, the planning you're making, the bluffing, it really twists your brain. And it is a ton of fun. I'm loving it. So that's Bonanza the Duel. So I have never played Bonanza. I know people have been trying to get me to play it. And can I be honest? I shied away from it because of the art. I saw some of the art and I was like, eh, I don't know. That doesn't yeah, look like my yeah. type of game. You know, and, and I saw bluffing and I went, oh, yeah, definitely not my type of game. And that's fair, and it may not be. I mean, if, if what I kind of talked about doesn't appeal to you, then I totally get that. But, and and is does Bonanza really evoke, does the dual game really evoke the, the bigger box card game? Mm, I don't know. Um, but I do think that it's very, very clever and very, very smart. And, um, you know, if you are in a situation where you're playing a lot of two-player games or looking for one and like to up the, the player interaction a little bit in a two-player game, this is a great one to try. 
And that's nice. Player interaction for me is key. And I mean, I saw Uwe Rosenberg and I mean, I love Uwe Rosenberg mm-hmm. games. So, I mean, it's one I would try based on that. I mean, it sounds interesting. For me, the game sounds interesting. I mean, it's about beans. I mean, yes. <laughs> I love my beans, okay? So, <laughs> the legume queen. <laughs> it's, not good for my, it's not good for the tummy, you know, but I do like the beans. <laughs> but anyways, I digress. <laughs> it's a game that I would be interested in trying for those reasons. <laughs> so, it, it's, I think it's one that if you're a Bonanza fan, would you say that it would be one that they would, people would like? Yeah, I think if people are fans of Bonanza and they want a two-player version, they should definitely check it out. Okay, very cool. I, I, you know, I think we need to play this. So now, so it's not about beans. It's about money, which might be a little bit more enticing. But uh, my last game that I want to talk about is Vegas Wits and Wagers. So if you play Wits and Wagers, it's like Wits and Wagers, but with a little twist. So there is a huge mat in this game. Oh, my goodness. But before we get to that, let's talk about the designer, <laughs> Dominic Carpuchet. Uh, artist is Ali Douglas, Ben Goldman, and publisher is North Star Games. So it is a party game. So if you haven't played Wits and Wagers, it's a party game trivia type game. It plays fairly quickly. It plays in about seven rounds. This new version, the Vegas version, has a huge mat, which also has the original mat on the other side. But we're talking about the Vegas side. So I like this because it adds a few elements. It adds like a 10 to 1 so you can bet on the long shot. You have no idea. People can psych you out and bluff you like, I know the answer. So you'll bet on them and lose one of your tokens. But you can gain a lot of money if you're right. And then I also like the fact they've added you can bet on red, which is like a whole bunch of answers. And you can bet on black, which is a whole bunch of answers. So, you know, if you're not sure if it's exactly that one, you can do a range, which I really liked. I also like that they have these covers that if you're playing with less players, you cover certain spots versus in the other version, you were kind of sharing spots with answers. And I didn't, I found that was a little confusing and weird in the other game. So not a bad thing. I just wasn't crazy about that. Um, and I also like the fact that it kind of tracks the rounds. So, you know, sometimes you play more than seven rounds. This actually has at the bottom, these little dice symbols and you put uh, tokens on it for the amount of uh, the the pips that you see. So if it's one, you have a 100 token. If it's two, 200. And whoever has the correct response gets that amount at the end of that round. So I'm like, that's pretty snazzy. Anyway, I played this a few times. Love, love, love. Everybody I play with really enjoys it. So I'm really looking forward to that. But you can only play it with the, right now, the party edition and the deluxe. Right. And and I'm a big fan of Wits and Wagers because I'm horrible at knowing trivia, but sometimes I'm a really lucky guesser, you know? And I love that element of like the picking the red and the black and um, kind of hedging your bets on a player. That's yes. brilliant. It, and um, I'm lucky enough to have been able to play this too. And um, those mats, the components are so nice. Those are really, really cool. I really, I like them a lot. really like it. And uh, side note, we need some uh, Canadian trivia because I don't know what measurements uh, is going on there with the Americans, but uh, I can't. <laughs> I have problems with the conversions. <laughs> I'm like, oh my uh. gosh, <laughs> that's such a good point. I never would have thought of that, but that's a great point. Like metric system and all that jazz. Well, I, I can do it, but it's just like, okay, now it's just like, I, I need a minute. Let me think about it before I answer here because I'll be way off if not. <laughs> oh, I think that's a good note. North Star. North Star, take note. Canadian <laughs> options. Metric options. Got stretch, it. stretch goal on the Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> the last game I'm going to talk about is Sentient from Renegade Games. Um, this one's designed by J. Alex Cavern, who designed World's Fair 1983. Um, and the art's from Chris Ostrowski, who... Um, Ostrowski, yes, who uh, also did the art for Renegade's game um, Blood of an Englishman. So uh, it's it's beautiful. It's it's like so many of Renegade's games right now. They're, it's just visually stunning to look at, which is great. Uh, Sentient is a game set in the future where you have all of these uh, androids, these robots that you're programming to do different things. And uh, These are represented by cards, essentially, and they have different factions in them, like transportation, military, service, industry, things like that. And there's five different types. And you have this player board, and there's a set collection element to it as you're trying to collect these cards of different types. And the cards are worth different points, too, on their own. And... What you're going to do to get these cards is there's actually an area control mechanism. So it's the cards are laid out in this market, and you have these little meeples that represent agents and assistants. And you put an agent out, you can choose to add assistance or not, and then you put it out over the card you want to take. You take that card and you leave the workers there for 
to mark that you spent them there. And then you take that card and you add it to your tableau. At the end of the round, you're going to count up all these markers because there's these little chevrons up there um, that are also marked with like transportation, military service of factions. And whomever has the most pieces, meeples or assistants or whatever, on either side of the chevron combined gets that chevron. And that'll be a point multiplier at the end of the game. And if you took second place, you get like a point. Um, great. So there's that cool area control thing to get that point mu- multiplier. Then you've gotten that card and you put it in this board that you have below this board you have, and you have these gorgeous custom dice in different colors. And at the beginning of the round, you roll them and you place them in the appropriate spots. When you put this card down, there's a little plus minus or equal sign in the upper corners. And when you put that card down, you have to rotate the, the dice that are next to it up, down, or leave them alone, according to the symbol, right? So that's that's an interesting kind of mechanism there. And the reason why that matters is that all of these cards have different things on them to determine if you get to score them. So maybe it says, hey, the sum of the two dice on this card need to add up to five. And if they do, you get three points. Or maybe it's, hey, the die on the left needs to be higher than the die on the right. Okay. But the dice are all in this row, so when you place one card and you're manipulating the dice, that could impact the score of the card next to it. And then when you're taking these cards, you're looking at these symbols going, okay, if I take that one, it's going to tick this die up and tick that one down, and oh, that'll ruin the scoring I have already set up for this card. And it, there's a lot of math in it. It is a very, very mathy game. Thankfully for me, it's simple math. It's just like addition and subtraction. But Across the board, you're doing a lot of calculations. So that's one kind of heads up I would give people. It's very, very mathy. I personally don't mind it at all in this game. Um, it it twists your brain. It still plays very, very quickly because there's just three quick rounds where you get four cards and then the round is over. So it still plays very, very quickly. But um, it does, it is a little bit, I say it has the perfect amount of brain burn for me. And then you're going to get these cards. You're going to shuffle the card, the four you got away and save them for the end of the game. And then at the end of the game, you take those chevrons and you say, okay, I've got a military chevron or investor, I think they're called. And then you count up how many military cards you have and you get a point for every chevron that you have. So if I have two military chevrons, I get two points per card I have that matches that and that kind of thing. So that's where getting those chevrons is really important. Being smart about picking the cards off the market is very important. But sometimes to get the chevron, you're taking a card that you don't really need. And there's all that calculation too. So Sentient is super mathy. It's gorgeous. I feel it still plays quickly. I've played it at two, three, and four, and I thought it played well at all player counts. Everybody I've played with has really enjoyed it, but some people definitely clicked with the math a little bit better than others. Um, but for me, I've played Senient a bunch. I've taught it a bunch, and it's a real hit for me. So that's uh, Senient from Renegade Games. And Mandy, you and I got to play this one together. We did, and I really enjoyed it. Can I be honest? I, I, if I was still teaching, this would be a classroom game. It totally has a lot of elements that are very useful for math. You know what I mean? Because now you have to think of you're using your greater than, your less than symbols, you know, equal to. You're also having to think of how it now affects other cards, so influencing of other cards. I I thought it was great. And, you know, people hear me joke about math all the time, you know, but um, I actually work in little, do a little finance at work. So it's not like I'm not unfamiliar. And I did teach a little math when I was, you know, a teacher. Um, But I thought it was a great smart game and attractive looking game. Yeah, it's 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 just beautiful. So um, Renegade seems, at least for me, is continuing on their kind of uh, parade of hits. So um, yeah, there you have it. So Mandy, let's let's go take a look at the crowdfunding world, should we? Absolutely. Ooh, that looks good. And that one. Okay, we really need to avoid crowdfunding campaigns. Wait, who are we kidding? They all look good. Let's pick one and discuss. Our next segment is aptly named Take My Money. Okay, so Take My Money. Oh my goodness. Ninjutsu. (laughs) 
There hasn't been a ton on Kickstarter lately. I'm just throwing it out there. That makes me go, ooh, I need that take my money. So <laughs> this one <laughs> did that. Now, I don't know. I'm on a light games kick right now. But next uh, next podcast, you know, it's going to be all heavy, crunchy stuff. So <laughs> let me get this out of here. So uh, Ninjitsu, which is published by Bluebeard Entertainment, designed by Peter C. Hayward and Kelly Joe. Uh, this is uh, currently on Kickstarter and uh, Canadian. Woohoo! So, you know, got to support. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a card game, and it has hidden actions, treasures, traps, and basically you're you're trying to I don't even know the like exact theme. It almost seems like it has like a ninja type theme, but basically you're trying to get to twenty one points and doing so by you know acquiring some treasures along the way and you know trapping your opponents. So I do like the fact that you have some cards. Uh, there's specific ones I have like masks on them and they're played face down. So when players are trying to get these cards, they don't know what they are. They could think it's something juicy and delicious and they want it. And it could be a trap, which, you know, that's not so good for you. <laughs> you may lose cards or, well, you know, it just has a bad overall effect. So swiping these treasures can be bad for you. Uh, it's interactive. It's a very fast gameplay. Like it plays in like five to 10 minutes. Well, I'd say maybe 10 minutes. And can I tell you, I'm not usually into these types of games and i was after it was done we were all like oh can we play it again like it was fun so and i mean everyone knows i do lunchtime games but anyone who really knows me knows i like heavy games so this was kind of nice that i found a light game that played quickly and we had fun playing it that sounds a lot of fun yeah and it, it looks really pretty too i think when i looked at it so that sounds cool the art's really good and you can combine ninjutsu with scuttle which is another game oh that's cool all right Well, I took a look and Diesel Demolition Derby, being published by Ludi Creations, caught my eye. This one's designed by Matthew Dunstan. And if that name doesn't ring a bell, if you know, you might know him as the designer of games like Costa Rica or Elysium. So, uh, you know, some nice design cred there. And the art is by Anthony Cournoyer, which I'm sure I just butchered my apologies. No, it was pretty good. It's actually French. Cournoyer. Cornoyer. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> we'll work on that. Uh, Diesel Demolition Derby is a pretty light and quick card game set in this this world that Ludi has kind of created um, called the Crisis World. There's this bigger box board game called Crisis they created a little bit ago, and their the world is called Diesel Punk, not Steampunk diesel punk world of crisis so in diesel demolition derby you have these combatant cards which are basically like robots or robot pieces and they all have different strengths and this is a drafting game and so when i kind of look at it i kind of think of sushi go but with robots and really really mean (laughs) so uh, you have these combatant cards and they all have different strength values and really at the end of the game you're just trying to have the most strength in the cards that you've managed to collect with these cards. And all the combatant cards do different things. But whereas, like, something like Sushi Go, you get points, different cards score differently just based on set collection. In Diesel Demolition Derby, the cards can do mean things, like switch cards, steal cards, destroy cards, change value of cards, and things like that. But it is very simple. You get a hand of cards, you pick one, put it face down, reveal it, and the effect takes place, and then you pass your hand. And then you pick another card from the hand you just got and play out the hand that way. So very simple mechanically. It's just the powers in these different combatant cards uh, are what really make the game. And, um, you know, I think if you like drafting games and you just want kind of a quick filler with maybe something a little bit with, you know, more player interaction than a lot of these other kind of lightweight drafting games, you might want to check out Diesel Demolition Derby uh, on Kickstarter from Ludi Creations. So is this a continuation of Crisis or it's like it's just set in that world? Because I have a friend who's been telling me Crisis is fantastic. I need to try it. And I actually regret not backing it because it was really it's really hard to find. Uh, Is that like part of that or it's it's separate? It's a completely separate game. But I actually think and it's it's escaping my mind. I I actually think this is at least the third game that they're just setting. They're creating their world building with all these different games. So it's a completely separate game just set in the diesel punk world. Um, And I did back Crisis. So, you know, Mandy, next time you and I get together, remind me and I'll bring it with me and and we'll play it together. Okay. Yeah. You just might not be able to find it after if I really like it. Mm, Noted. I got my (laughs) eye on you, girl. I can't keep an eye on you. (laughs) Looking forward to playing it. 
<laughs> awesome. Well, we always talk about new games and we talk about crowdfunding games, but you and I both also respect and value older games. So let's go take a look at some of those, shall we? As I do the running man. <laughs> <laughs> Turn off Matlock and put away your Vicks Vapo Rub. It's time to talk about those older games that we still love to play in the upcoming segment, Shelf Staple. Welcome to the Shelf Staple segment. Mandy and I really wanted to make sure we took some time to appreciate games that aren't quite as new, aren't quite as hot as some of the other games we get to talk about here. So this is our opportunity to appreciate some of the older games we might have on our shelf. Kind of like, you know, Golden Girls. It's like (laughs) old, you know, older. I'm Dorothy. All right. Wait, yeah, you're Dorothy. I was just going to ask, like, what golden girl are you? You think you're Dorothy? I thought I was Dorothy. Wait a minute, we can't have two Dorothys. I'm kind of crotchety, so it kind of works. It's true. You are pretty crotchety. Okay, (laughs) so, okay, then I get to be Sophia. Okay, and that works, because it's mom-daughter. They have, like, a, you know, that snarky kind of relationship. Did you just call me old? I think you just called me old. Okay, no, I'm good. I'm good. Well, I'll be the mom. I don't know know what you're talking about. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right, Dorothy, tell me what you pulled (laughs) off of your shelf today. Well, Sophia. (laughs) I I played and purchased Amerigo. So mm. I was like, darn, this is good. And what about you? What game did you do or play? Oh, uh, well, I, I couldn't resist. I had to bring for our first shelf staple episode. I had to bring Kalis to the table. Mm. Mm, it's you'll you'll hear me. I uh, just <laughs> right. But, you know, I have to admit, I've never played Amerigo. And so it's. It's, it's interesting that you pulled it off. I mean, it's, it's a few years old, but it's a Feld. You're so predictable. Uh, so, yes, anybody who doesn't know knows that I heart Stefan Feld. Uh, so. I'm going to have to protect him from you, Essen, aren't I? I'm gonna have He's to be not like, listening yet. Stefan, so Dandy's coming, run! He doesn't know. He doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you haven't figured it out by now, America was designed by Stefan Feld, one of my favorite designers, published by Arclight and Queen Games, and Artistries by Harold Liskey and Klaus Stefan. So, if I mispronounce anyone's names, I apologize. But basically, you want to know what's it about. You're basically exploring islands of South America, securing trading routes, building settlements. But wait now, there's more. So, <laughs> I know you're thinking, what is the draw to this game? It's like, yeah, okay, whatever, it's old. The Tower. The Tower. <laughs> <laughs> the tower <laughs> who says that right about a game the tower so i had heard about this tower i'm like hey I-, I gotta see what the big deal is okay let me tell you it was like childhood memories of that game on uh price is right uh plinko clanko plinko what's it called pachinko uh plinko plinko we'll go with that okay so i'm sure yeah. someone on bgg will correct us so <laughs> i'm no doubt <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna go with that but literally you take your cubes which are you know you're gonna use these for actions drop them down and then whatever comes out, that's what you got to work with for that round. Oh, wow. That sounds really, really cool. Darn tootin'. So you take them out, pop them on, populate the colors on the board because it matches the cube. And you're going to kind of resolve each color, uh, you know, in order. So basically you start there. Is anyone doing the action or can afford to do actions with these colored cubes and so forth? So I liked that part because, it, you know, you're planning a little bit ahead and see if you can afford it. And the pirates love the pirates. There are pirates in the game because literally all I know about Amerigo is it's a really big box yes. and it's got a dude with like a spyglass <laughs> on it, but I've never played it. So, I mean, I didn't even know there were pirates in the game. Yeah. So, you know, typical Stefan Feld. It's like point salady, but like it's okay. I'm going to get killed for saying this. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but I feel <laughs> like, I know uh, that's not what I mean. It's just, it's not a good word, but you can ease into the play. Well, do you know what I mean? There's some games you're like, Oh, I need to play it like three, four times. And you're like, Oh, I'm still trying to figure it out. This one. Yes. There's strategy, of course, but like, you're like, okay, I understand what's happening. And you have that planning that you can do based on what cubes are available. I like that. So mm. that now, did you, I mean, I think the cube tower looks awesome and <laughs> Clearly, you're a fan of it, but did it feel gimmicky, or did it really did it really add to the game for you? I like the fact that it mitigated what was coming out. Do you know what I mean? Like it kind of it kind of said, oh, okay, well, these are the cubes you get to work with this round. So you know, ding ding, fight. <laughs> Literally, that's you know, that's what I felt like. You know, you really had to plan that out. 
Nice. And like, so is it, is it, is it interactive? Cause I mean, a lot of Euros and a lot of Steffenfeld games are very much, you know, Euro-y, um, you kind of do your own thing. Like, it, was it, there a lot of player interaction or, or how did that work in it? So every game with me is interactive. So <laughs> let's just go with that. <laughs> <laughs> but in this game, I mean, it really depends on how you look at it. So when you were doing like kind of the actions on uh, the water and like the land there, so the, on the modular board, in that sense, yes, because you don't want to get blocked off by somebody else's uh, uh, their resources, the planting and what they're doing in, in their area. So in that regard, yes, you're kind of interacting that way. It's not direct, but you do have to be aware. I think that's probably a better word. And then during, you know, the phase with the cubes, it's not super interactive. It's more just like, okay, you're kind of planning what you need to do, but you're speaking out loud because you see other players kind of taking those actions. You're like, oh, I kind of need that. And now you've got to rethink it. So in that sense, you're kind of, it's more like, hey, I need that. Why'd you take that? More of that kind of interaction. But no, it's not overly interactive, but still enjoyable. Like you didn't feel like you were playing it by yourself. Okay. No, that sounds, I mean, and, and Lord knows I love me some cubes, so there's no judgment there. And that tower looks amazing. Really good. Liked it a lot. If you haven't tried it, definitely you need to try it. If you're a Stephen Fell fan, you need this in your collection. So we're just going to end there, and you're going to tell me about the love of your life, Kalis. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Oh, I adore my Kalis King so much. That stern, grumpy face. And he actually reminds me of my dad, because my dad always has a super grumpy look on his face, but that's a different story. Um, you know, Kalis, I think it was published in 2005 from Yastari originally. Now, like, it's been, uh, you know, reprinted or, or distributed by other publishers, too. But I think Yastari was the original. It's designed by William Adia. And the arts, um, the original art is by Cyril and Arnaud Demed, which... Yikes on that name. My apologies. But, uh, you know, hopefully somebody will correct me on that one. They'll forgive you. But, you know, Kalis is like, oh, my gosh, Kalis is totally the love of my life. I so adore that grumpy Kalis King with that stern look. I actually, he kind of reminds me a little bit of my dad. because My dad is always super grumpy looking, but that's a different story. Um, but, you know. Kalis, I think it was published like 2005, which in today's board game world is ancient. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was originally published by Yastari Games, um, designed by William Adia. And the original art's by Cyril and Arnaud Demed, mm -hmm. which it's it's got an interesting spelling, so I probably butchered that. Um, but, you know, I am a big fan of worker placement games. I love worker placement as a mechanism. And Kalis is... A seminal worker placement game. I mean, really, if you're a fan of worker placement games, you really should try Kalis. Um, you know, it's got some theme about building a castle for a king, and you grow this town, and you add buildings, and buildings give you resources, and resources <laughs> let you buy more buildings. I, I mean, it's it, it sounds super dry. No, it doesn't. It's a worker placement. All the things you listed are elements of a worker placement and now this game so you could let me know everyone says this is a game you need to play and is it because sure. it's that classic worker placement like i guess what i'm trying to say is what about it that i'm like you know like in america you have the tower what in this game is like ooh, tell me more all right great okay, okay so <laughs> kalis is mean Ooh, it is mean and in a really sly way <laughs> so there is this this care this you know, white piece called the provost. And he goes down to the end of the building and you can, there's abilities that let you move this provost back and forth. So you put your workers all out on these buildings and then the provost moves and the buildings that are after the provost don't trigger. Oh. So if you kind of work to move the provost up, you could completely, somebody could put their workers down at the end of the road because the buildings are super juicy and then you can hose them by moving the provost back and being like, uh-uh, nothing for you. And it is agonizing. And there is a little bit of, like, uh, collusion sometimes between players because you may double, like, if the leader is way down there, you may, like, tag team and, like, both work to move the provost back. That meanness is uncommon okay. in worker placement to that level. And I, I just, I think that's so much fun. You can also, like, pass early and then make everybody else's actions more expensive, which is one of my go-to <laughs> moves. I'm like, I'm passing. And everybody yells at me, and I love it. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it's 
all the mechanisms are very basic and very foundational mm-hmm. for worker placement. And I think if you play Kalis, you'll see how it is inspired other worker placement games later. And I think that that's really cool. I think, you know, you play Kalis even if you hate it. Yep. I mean, you're wrong if you hate it. <laughs> but even if you hate it, at least you've had, you know, you gain an appreciation for what it added to gaming. And I think that there's a low value, you know, a lot of value in that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's super mean. It won like Golden Geek Game of the Year back in the day and all that stuff. It's it's a rock solid game, but it's also a heartbreaking game for me. Oh, and why is that? I feel like this is like the old flame, you know, came back into your <laughs> life. <laughs> I know, right? Did Sophia had a lot of old flames, so I'm yeah, down with this storyline. All right, I can work with it. Um, they released this special edition. Kalis is my number one game. I love this game. It's in my. I just I treasure it. They released a special edition a number of years ago, and I didn't to pick it up. Ooh. And it has this art by an artist named Mike Doyle, and it is so gorgeous. <laughs> and it's impossible to get. And it just, it sits out there in the world, and I know it's out there, and I know I can never have it, <laughs> and it makes me weep. And so, uh, Kalis is my favorite game, but it's also the one that breaks my heart, which seems oddly appropriate. I don't know. <laughs> so now, okay, so... Should I be like getting or playing this game, or is it going to be like unattainable? Like, what is the? It sounds interesting, simple actions, but that's okay. The, I think we have a theme today with the whole meanness thing. I don't know what's happening there, but is this, we're mean people. That's what it comes down. To. <laughs> you know, I'm really starting to wonder. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one that like staple. Should someone have this in their collection? Oh gosh, it's something that it, it, like uh, as much as I love it, I would never tell anybody go and buy this game. Unless I knew him really well. Um, but it's one you should try. You should absolutely try. It's easy to get. I mean, the, the special edition's impossible to get. And Mandy, I'm telling you, mm-hmm. if you manage to get a copy, I'm 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 stealing it from you. I'm breaking into your house. I'm <laughs> I'm flying to Toronto. I'm breaking into your house and I'm stealing it. Just heads up. <laughs> but the normal edition's really easy to get. It's in board game libraries everywhere and, and all this other stuff. So give it a try. Um, there's even an app for it. You oh, know? And the app is a little dated. I'm not going to say it's the best app. <laughs> but uh, the best part of the app is that when you pick up your worker, um, they wiggle in the air like somebody's <laughs> picked them up by the back of the collar. And then, like, the little, like, it's so random to add that to an app. So it's funny. hilarious. Yeah. It just makes you feel like you're in it. Do you know what I mean? And you're exactly. You're feeling that, ah. <laughs> it's so visceral. I'm moving you, worker. So, yeah. <laughs> so, Kalis, you know, Amerigo sounds amazing. That that tower, I I like a little bit of randomization in a game. Yes. So that tower, I gotta admit, that is just tickling my fancy. I really want to try it. I really liked how it managed the, you know, the cubes. So sometimes you had a round where you had like none of some colors and then a ton of others. It's like, well, wait now, that changed what I was about to do this round. So it really makes you rethink what you're going to do. And you know, I, I like the fact that you have lots of actions: moving ships, loading cannons. You can plan progress. It's it's a felt. Lots happening. It's, it's, there's an ease of play. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I mean, a lot of felts can be a little more opaque, really. Um, Luna is one that kind of comes to mind where I felt like that wasn't, it didn't have that ease of play. So that makes you, you're really, like, that makes Amerigo sound super appealing. Yeah, so. we will definitely mm. play this together. I love it. The box is ginormous, but uh, <laughs> oh, we'll figure that out. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So next time we hang out together in person, I think we're going to have a game training exchange between Kalis and Amerigo. Sound like a good deal? Absolutely. And if uh, Mr. Feld is listening, feel free. I wouldn't mind any signed copies of your games. I won't stalk you, I promise. (laughs) (laughs) The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. And by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Suze, so many interesting topics to consider. But let's make sure that we get the audience to weigh in as well. We present and discuss engaging topics and ask for your input in our segment, Victory Points. So, in a game, Victory Points are important, right? You want them to win. But let's be honest, I rarely win at a game, but I still get victory points, so I feel like I've contributed to the game. So in our segment about 
well, entitled Victory Points, we want to talk about hot topics in board gaming, but not just me, not just from Suzanne, but for you, from you as well. So with that being said, we have a topic we're going to talk about today, but in the future, we will have a thread in the BGG Guild with a poll that, hey, you can jump in on and give us your thoughts and opinions. So today, we're going to be talking about conventions. I think it's appropriate. Hmm. However, did we come up with that topic, Mandy? This is so timely. <laughs> I know. Hmm. 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 It's almost like you just finished up Gen Con. Look at that. How convenient. I certainly did. Which is kind of funny because, you know, behind the scenes peak here or whatever, you know, like the Wizard of Oz pulling back the curtain. <laughs> We're actually recording this before Gen Con. Right. So it's a little weird. Like, we can't talk about Gen Con in this episode because it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. But um, have you... Obviously, Gen Con is, is the timely thing right now, either way, whether before or immediately after. So have you gone to Gen Con before? So, yeah, this is... Well, this will be or this was my second Gen Con. The first one was, holy moly... Well, first of all, it was like a 13-hour drive. Let's start with that. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then it was just... It was overwhelming. It was a lot to take in. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's that's everything. I've never been. But certainly everything I've seen online, and, and I have a lot of friends who've attended, it's massive, and it's a spectacle. Uh, and I I just, I don't even think I can imagine the immensity of it. So was it fun? Did you have a good time? It was fun. It definitely is a working con. So I definitely feel there's some drawbacks in that. Like, people are like, oh, well, you're working, and it's a 13-hour drive. Like, it doesn't sound very enticing. But I get to see people there that, you know, I wouldn't see normally because we don't live in the same country, city, whatever the case may be. But it, yes, it's fun, but it, there's work. If from a reviewer perspective, as someone just attending, there's so much to see. You can't sit down and play, like, four-hour games. You're not going to get to see everything. And maybe that's the point. Maybe you're not supposed to see everything. Yeah. Do they even have gaming areas? I mean, they have all the booths, right? All the vendors have sp space to demo or whatever, but do they have, they have like an open gaming or a gaming room, don't they? Oh yeah, it's huge. And it's late. Like I remember playing games till, oh my goodness, super late in the morning. That's probably why I got sick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Contra. And, but, yeah, exactly. But it was full. Gaming tables okay. across the way. Oh yeah, definitely. Because that was one of the complaints I heard about Origins this year was that there were no gaming tables. Like there was an open gaming area and it was like eight tables or something like that. Ridiculous. Small amount of tables and the time, like just when I was, because I worked Origins like for a company, just when you sit down, stretch your legs, open a box, it's like, oh, okay, they're closing the hall in an hour? What? Like it just seemed like time was also a factor there. Oh, well, because the conventions I've gone to all have, like, 24-hour gaming. They closed it? No word of a lie. We're sitting there, and I'm like, are you kidding me right now? I think it was, like, midnight or one. And I'm like, um, okay, so basically anybody who was working, we got kind of hosed. Oh, that's sad. That's unfortunate, because, I mean, gaming, I mean, playing games is what it's all about, and Origins looks like such a great venue and such a great crowd. That's, that's, that's unfortunate. You know, I, I just don't know, like... I would like to go to Gen Con, but I'm not a big crowds person. Mm -hmm, and I'm too. also not the kind of person that, f don't get me wrong, I love new games. I love all the new hotness. I am totally cult of the new. But <laughs> I, for some reason, like, I'm okay with waiting a couple of extra months to get the game. So I don't know if I would be at the door rushing like my friends that map out their route through the vendor hall to make sure. Oh, yeah. They oh, have like, they wow. print out the map and they mark it up and they chart their path. Um, I'm not quite like that. So I don't feel like I'm missing out on that. Um, and, you know, in spite of the fact that I, I do content with the Dice Tower and things like that, you know, I, I would, I, you know, I would be running the halls, I assume, like everybody else kind of trying to check what's right. out. I mean, do you think that? without that work as a reviewer, right, that you do and interviewing and stuff like that, what would you be doing at Gen Con? I, see, and that's a thing. Like, I'm such a workaholic. But if I, it was a different role for me, I think you can't see everything. You really can't. So I think you got to focus on the things that interest you and focus on those. So if there's a 
five or six games you're like, I'm dying to try, I would rather go and play through those games. Wow, I like that. I'd like to get that when it comes out. Then try and flit around to five, 10, 15 different places getting a taste. It's like a good pie. Do you want just a little nibble of the crust? No, 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 no. We want the crust and the filling. Thank you very much. With a little bit of ice cream. A la mud. So, you know, that's how I feel about Gen Con. Or any other con, for that matter. That's like a heavy working con. Well, now you just compared Gen Con to pie. So now I desperately, desperately want to go to Gen Con. Holy cow. It's like a strawberry rhubarb. It's like a flavor that it's like, really? Like, that really shouldn't be a pie, but it's delicious? Yeah, it is. That's like one of my favorite pies, too. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You're selling me on this show, Mandy. Now I'm really, really sad that I don't get to go to Gen Con. Oh, my goodness. In spite of the crowds, now I really want to go for the strawberry rhubarb Gen Con. Exactly. See? I- I'm selling it. I can't- what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> well, what about, like, now, did you... So, because you were working... Like, what about true dungeon like we're really focused on board gaming but like there's the true dungeon there's all the cosplay did you see a lot of that last year are you going to try to seek any of that out this year definitely see a lot of cosplay like in passing you definitely see a lot of side events like i've been getting a lot of notifications for like rpg related events i saw a lot of uh what con was i went to they were doing like a little larp uh the live action yeah Yeah, i was like that's really cool i mean it's not something that i do but I would try it if I had the time. Like, little things like that. Things that I normally wouldn't try, I would like to try. I just feel like that's not the con for that. Oh, for interesting. Me. Yeah, Do yeah. you know what I mean? Because typically conventions are so great for trying out things that you normally wouldn't get to do. Like, it's such a great idea to do a mega game or that mammoth game of, you know, Twilight Imperium 3 or yes. try a game that you are unsure about, like you were talking about, and, and saying, oh, you know – oh, thank goodness I tried this because there's no way I'd want to buy this. Or, oh my goodness, I have to have this game now that I've tried it, right? That kind of experience that you get at conventions um, that you just can't get in everyday kind of game store experiences seems like that would be perfect. But I totally understand like the ancillary stuff like True Dungeon. Or I have to admit, for me, I'm so obsessed with gaming. All that other stuff holds very little interest to me. So. Right. Hmm. It's 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 kind of like I feel like so when I brought up about pie, it's like they make this pie so delicious. Oh, you're killing it's me. like there's too much sugar. Like it's overload. It's like you just don't know, is it the crust? Is it the filling? It's also delicious, but it's sweet, and I know it's gonna give me a cavity and like that's literally how your brain works at Gen Con. It hurts <laughs> so game. good. It hurts yes. so good. Why do I? That's a song. Hurts so good. Oh, yeah. Da-da-da-da. Sing it, girl. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, we got you signed up for karaoke now. Team karaoke. <laughs> oh, goodness. I'm taking requests. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But, so now people who can't go to cons, and I mean, it's not always feasible. You are, a, well, you run it. Jen can't. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, as we're talking about this, you know, and that that whether you want to rush the doors or things like that, I know so many of my friends that I talk to, they have this, this, I think the kids these days call it FOMO, right? (laughs) F-O, yeah, FOMO, the, um, the fear of missing out. Oh, that's, dear. that's how you say it, right? Like YOLO, like FOMO. I don't know. I'm really old. So people are like, oh my gosh. She's so old. Why is she talking like this? But I'm I'm Sophia, right? Exactly. Um, I I know a lot of my friends have this like fear of missing out and this kind of sadness about not going to Gen Con. And for Gen Con, what we do is we do this thing called Gen Can't. And you know, really, ultimately, the point for us is we wanted to create something fun to do during Gen Con. So that we had something fun to do as well. And so that we didn't spend a lot of time just focusing on what we were missing out because we had things to do ourselves. And I think that's probably the best lesson from Jen Cant. And, you know, I know probably a lot of the listeners listen to Tom and Eric and you all talk about these amazing conventions that you get to go to and how fabulous and fun they are. And I totally get that idea of like, oh, I feel like I'm sad because I'm missing out on that. Mm-hmm. And so that's just the way I choose to combat it when it comes up is, you know, Hold, you know, host a game night, host an Origins game night during Origins and have your friends over and order a bunch of really bad for you pizza and eat that <laughs> strawberry rhubarb pie and play a bunch of games that you have or make a theme. Um, our friend Marguerite Cottrell, Maggie Bot, mm, yeah. she does this 
this amazing thing called a four by four where she and her friends get together and they play four board games simultaneously. Oh my goodness. It's wackadoo wild and it's Love amazing. It. But like what like that would be so much fun to do during a big convention that you can't attend and making making the moment special for you no matter where you are. Um exactly. in small ways or big ways. So that's that's kind of how you know, if anybody out there is listening and like, Oh, I wish I could be there. Oh, I'm so sad I missed out, you know, maybe next convention give it a try and you never know. Maybe that would help with your F O M O. That's like I should probably not. stop talking like a like a teenager, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, it's totally fine. I just it took me a minute there. Oh, that's what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so, what convention after Gen Con is it? Is it Essen then? It is Essen, and I've heard Essen is kind of like the European <laughs> Gen Con. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, it's going to be a, a busy working con, right, with lots of meetings and interviews and all that other stuff. Absolutely, but we're. It's, I mean, we're doing stuff we like. I mean, I get to talk about games. I get to talk to yes. designers about games. I mean, I can't go wrong. Do you know what I mean? I'm getting to work with cool people. I, I mean, it, it, it's a really different experience when you're looking at it from as a reviewer as versus just someone just, you know, just attending. Mm-hmm. It, it's different. It's still overwhelming, I think, in both regards, but different. Yeah. So for me, cons, like, ugh, I guess they're great to go to, but cons, you really want it to feel... I, I, I don't even know how to like phrase it. You just want to feel like it's it's it should be fun, but you feel comfortable. And I'm like, is that happening, or are cons getting too big, oh, too much? Maybe that's a topic for our next victory points or something. Oh, mm. and then we can get some input from <laughs> the you know the listeners. I was about to say viewers because I'm so used to video, but <laughs> <laughs> listeners. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know. That's an interesting discussion. And you know, conversely, are they getting too big? Are there enough, right? Because one of the neat things I've seen lately are a lot of local conventions, like the G2 Summit or Geekway to the West or KublaCon, right? Mm -hmm. Smaller than Gen Con, vastly smaller, but still really great events that people in different cities and states and and towns or countries can go to. And maybe, maybe that's the evolution of conventions. You get these massive oversized ones and maybe it just hits critical mass and then smaller ones start to pop up. Well, I'm hoping, like, I mean, in Canada, we have a few, like, I'm going to HalCon uh, this year, which is in Halifax, and that's, you know, East Coast, so it's kind of nice, and uh, Breakout is one they have in Toronto, it's just before Gamma, so that one's, and these are ones that do well, and I know they're going to be doing the, the Shut Up and Sit Down that's going to happen on the West uh in like Vancouver. I just wish we had one. I mean, and, and maybe this is what's going to happen. These cons are going to get so big, like what you said, other little ones will start popping up. I mean, I live in Ottawa, the nation's capital, and we don't have huge cons, and I feel like, you know, we're missing out. Maybe just have those. I don't know. Put us on the map a little bit, but I don't want it to become overwhelming. But guess what? If it's popular, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Auto, Ottoans need their conventions. <laughs> Auto, Ottoanians? Auto, Auto, uh, uh, what, what do you, uh, uh, Ottoanians? Uh, no, I, I think I'm getting farther O-town- away from what it we'll is. We'll go with O-Towners. Let's just go with that. O-Towners? O-Towners. <laughs> O-Town, O-Towners. <laughs> okay, there we go, O-Towners. Well, I, you know, I think we could talk about conventions a lot. Um, sure. But, you know, it's interesting to hear your POV on Gen Con, especially just, you know, because you call out your perspective as, as, you know, it's kind of, in a way, work for you. Mm. I know I would be super interested, you know, as we go into Essen or things like that, what some of the listeners are interested in hearing about conventions, what they love about conventions, what they hate about conventions, what they really make, you know, wish they could see more of or less of and, and um, what they do at home, you know, to handle that, that fear of missing out, to handle kind of that wistfulness of not being at a convention and what do they do at home or what are their ideas that they, you know, to manage that. Um, I think, you know, if you we start a thread in the BGG Guild, I'd love to hear input. Yeah. And maybe maybe in a future Victory Points segment, we'll talk more about conventions and get to include people's thoughts and comments that way. Yeah, and we want people to really, like, speak your mind about it. Don't be afraid to say, you know, I don't like this or I really like this. Like, we want to talk about that because, you know, we're starting, we're easing into this one. But don't worry. <laughs> 
I've got a couple that'll, you know, blow your socks off. (laughs) (laughs) I just have to say right now, it's so sad that this is an audio only medium sometimes because you are making the funniest faces when you talk. You get so excited and animated. I'm so glad we're (laughs) Skyping to do this because I get to see all your expressions. (laughs) Oh, my weirdness. Nobody needs to see that. Yeah, no, no. It's it's priceless. But um, (laughs) so, yeah, so we'll do that in the BGG Guild. And for the next Victory Point segment, we're actually, like Mandy mentioned earlier, we're going to do a poll on whatever topic we decide to do for that. So we really, really hope that you'll jump into the guild and vote in the poll and leave comments in that thread so that we can include some of your thoughts in um, this segment next time. Absolutely. We are very much looking forward to that. So that's it. You made it through our official first podcast. Woo! Woo! So hopefully you'll come back and we didn't scare you away. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us. We were so thrilled to have you listen to us and join us. It was exciting times for us. Very much so. And yeah, I, I'm so excited for the next show. Speaking of the next show, there are a few topics or segments that we have that we didn't even touch on yet because they're going to be in rotation. So what am I, one that I'm looking forward to is tap that app. Oh, yes. We will be talking about some pretty cool apps. So that's just one of a few that we're going to be looking at. So Keep your ears open for that. So the next podcast, 520, is going to be with Eric and Tom. And you know they're going to be talking about Gen Con stuff. So listen for that and what fun and new things they're going to be bringing to the podcast there. So I think we're done. That's it. I think it. we're done. That's a wrap. Oh, my goodness. We made it. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy, and Eric, with assistance from Itai Perez, Derek Porter, and Rob Seary. Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. Okay, Mandy, you want to play a game? I like games. (laughs) All right, let's play Two Truths and a Lie. Okay, let's do it. What do you think? (laughs) Give her. (laughs) All right, uh, okay, I'll go first. Um, All right, Two Truths and a Lie. Uh, I speak five languages, some better than others. Uh, I used to ride in the rodeo, and and I'm related to a U.S. president. Ooh, some tough ones. Mm. Okay, right, don't, okay, I want to hear yours. All right, here I we go. So, I own a hockey stick signed by the Calgary Flames when they won the Stanley Cup. Uh, I own a pair of cowboy boots, and I have size 12 feet. Oh my goodness, I don't know. I know. That's so a tough one. Let's leave it the All suspense right. and we'll find out next episode. <laughs>